The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. Which means if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning this subject we're studying. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. We're still on the subject of the Christian alcoholic slash drug addict. We went over the parameters. Uh, I won't go over them again. I'll just uh, begin with uh, a story that I read. There was a drunk. He said he, well, he had been drinking most of the night at the bar and he decided it was time to go home. So he stumbled out to his car, got in, sat down, he looked around, he said, holy, what in the world? So he's looking, he calls 911, he says, uh, officer, somebody's stolen my steering wheel, somebody's stolen my dashboard, somebody's stolen my gear shifter, I don't, I don't have anything, they've taken everything out of my car, I don't even have a radio. And the officer said, okay, I'll be out. So he hangs up the phone. And then about two minutes later, the police receive another call, and the uh, drunk calls back and says, uh, never mind, I was sitting in the back seat. So <laughs> that's the story of what can happen when you overindulge in alcoholic beverage. Well, the, the truth is, uh, before Genesis 9.20, and I told you we'd be studying Noah, so turn in your Bibles to Genesis 9.20 if you have one on you. And uh, we'll begin to study Noah. And the truth, before Genesis 9.20, there's no mention of wine, alcohol, no mention of drunks, no mention of anything. Now that's in Genesis 9, before the flood. Genesis 9.20 is the verses after the flood. And then after the flood, my goodness, the Bible just opens up with verse after verse concerning wine and drunkenness and everything else. Actually, after the flood, the world opens itself up to, for alcoholics, a new problem. And for the world, as uh, the, uh, the outside world, outside of the alcoholic, it often talks about wine in a pleasurable sense in terms of those who can handle themselves. In terms of those who cannot, it is always in a negative sense. And I can tell you that, look, you can look it up yourself. Before Genesis 9.20, no mention of alcohol. You say, why? That's what anybody would say. Well, why not? Why after 9.20 is there all this mention of alcohol, wine, drunkenness? But before Genesis 9.20, there's no problems with it. And yet there were many problems, but no problem with alcohol. Now, God wiped out the earth before there was ever a drunkard. That is, wiped it all out except for Noah and his children. And uh, you legalists would sit there and say, how is that possible? Why, there must have been drunkards. They were fornicating and going crazy. There were drunkards everywhere before the flood. No, there weren't. Not one person was a drunkard before the flood. The reason why is because before the flood, there was no bacteria. After the flood, bacteria came on the scene. As a result, there was a breakdown of grape juice, which became wine. And the first one who ever had any taste of wine was Noah. Why? He was a farmer. That comes out in Genesis 9.20. And then after that, you say, I don't believe, how do you know that? Look it up. Before 9.20, nothing. After Genesis 9.20, wine is mentioned, Genesis 9.24. Genesis, um, let's see, what else we have? Genesis 14.18, Genesis 19.32, 19.33, 19.34, 19.35. I mean, wine is just then, it's all throughout the Bible. Before that, no fermentation. After the flood, fermentation. And immediately, we find the first person who ever got drunk. His name's Noah. Now, we can't say he was an alcoholic, but he did get drunk. He lived 350 years after the flood, so I'm sure he figured out very quickly you cannot drink as much as he drank that first time he ever started drinking wine. And then it says in Genesis 9.20, Noah, 
a man of the soil pro proceeded to plant a vineyard. In other words, beforehand he had planted, planted a vineyard and they had produced grapes and grape juice. Well, now he plants one and he produces this and it sits out in the sun and it ferments and there's bacteria working on it and it turns into alcoholic beverage. So when he drank some of its wine, in verse 21, he became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Now in the Hebrew, there's a lot more to this and uh, some of it's rather shocking. What happened was that he became drunk. He was out of it. He didn't even know what he was doing, but he was messing with his own self. That is what comes out in the Hebrew. Lay uncovered, naked of course, but that's what you think. He's just laying there naked. No, he's, he's messing with, him, with his own self, playing with himself. Then in verse uh, 22, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father playing with himself, and told his two brothers outside. Well, not, not Ham, but let's, let's, yeah, that's what happened. Then verse 23. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father messing with himself. Then when Noah awoke from his wine, he woke from his drunkenness, and he found out what his youngest son had done to him. Uh, through memory, he, he slowly put stuff together and from the brothers talking. Now what did, what did Ham do? Well, he went in and messed with his own father. And that's debauchery. And that's what results oftentimes from drunkenness. And that's what's brought out in many of the passages in the New Testament especially. Especially the Apostle Paul would bring it out Drunkenness leads to all sorts of debauchery, and debauchery is related to those immoral, degenerate sins, homosexuality in this case, actually homosexuality and incest in this case. Now what occurred? Ham was cursed. The whole race was created from Ham. Cursed be Canaan. He, it became a slave race, and to this day is still a slave race as part of the curse. And how did it all start? Well, with a drunk man named Noah. The first experience with alcohol. It wasn't a good one, was it? Pretty, pretty disgusting. And then on from there, there are other uh, issues mentioned with wine. Not all of which are bad, but we'll focus on the bad part since we're dealing with the Christian alcohol. And another time, Genesis 19.32, here's another point of, of drunkenness which leads to debauchery. We have Lot, and his daughters could not find a husband. Actually, they could not find a husband of their own race, which was very important at that time, so they conspired amongst themselves, Lot's two daughters, and they said, hey, we need to sleep with our father. And they knew that he would not sleep with them if he was in a normal state of mind. He would say, you women are, my own daughters are perverts, gross people. How is this even, how could you even think of such a thing as what he would say in his normal frame of reference, his normal frame of thinking. But they conspired to get him drunk. And so they said in Genesis 9, 32, let's get our father drunk. And then, when he is drunk, we'll sleep with him, and then we will preserve our family line through our father. It was a big deal to get pregnant and have children in those days, and instead of waiting on the Lord, they wanted to go ahead and get pregnant uh, with their own father's seed, which is, you know, gross, debauchery. And that's exactly what happened. And first, the older daughter went in, and she said she got pregnant by her father, and then the younger uh, daughter got excited and said, well, get him drunk. Oh, let's get him drunk again so I can do the same thing. Then we have another curse race coming out of that. I won't go into detail of where these lines go or the races uh, that come out of these, but they are both cursed. And these, these are the negative sides of alcohol that we will mention in going through the Bible and looking at wine and alcohol. There are many instances where it is... Um, absolutely legitimate but when it comes to becoming drunk it is not legitimate at all it leads to debauchery and all types of weird things that have happened in human history 
from the very beginning of it, from Noah onward. Now Solomon, actually David wrote to Solomon in Proverbs, uh, but uh, Solomon publicized it, in, in which uh, Solomon uh, becomes the writer of much of Proverbs. It's what his father had told him in doctrine. His father was David. And then in Ecclesiastes, we have some other things that need to be explained. But in Proverbs 23, 20, it says, Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. Now, we have two issues here. Do not join those who drink too much wine. Don't join the persistent drunkard. Or those who gorge themselves on meat. And you say, well, if you gorge yourself on meat, you're not going to act too weird, are you? It's not going to make you drunk. Sometimes the two go hand in hand. But sometimes they don't. Now, why, is, why are both of these brought up? And why is the... Why is it say, do not join? Why is it such a stern command? And if you're an alcoholic, you don't like it. If you have an eating disorder, you don't like to hear it. But it's part of the Word of God. You've got to accept it and realize we all have an area of weakness. This is not, I'm not judging you. I wouldn't judge you if you were a gossip all the time. I'm not going to get involved in your life. I don't care. I care in the sense we all need to live a spiritual life. He that is spiritual. Now, we're all going to mess up, but we're dealing with something persistent. And if you're persistent in being drunk, that is day by day by day, or persistent in gorging yourself with meat, becoming a glutton, and the two are mentioned, why? It has to do with garbage in the stream of consciousness, oftentimes brought about from an environment that wasn't too pleasant in childhood. And there's so much garbage that needs to be flushed out. And I've had many people talk to me who've had problems with alcohol, drug abuse, all types of disorders. And uh, you get that when you teach the Word of God in your past. You hear all sorts of things. But the, the whole problem, it boils down to one thing. Garbage in the stream of consciousness. And a lot of them will say, man, you don't even know what happened in, child, in my childhood. And I'd say, look... I don't want to know what happened. What you need to do is flush out the garbage along with everyone else. I mean, there are those who get involved in gossip, maligning, judging. We're not discussing them right now. They too have garbage. They were raised in a legalistic home. They wouldn't even think of a Christian being a drunkard or a glutton. Although they might pass, away, pass on with the glutton. I heard a preacher once just going crazy on the drunkard. The drunkard this and the drunkard that. And I could tell he was a fat pastor because he got to the glutton part and he said, well, glutton here, I would rather be a glutton than a drunk. And he pounded the thing. Now, that's not what the Bible says. They put, it puts the two together. Why? Why? There's a reason. We're not in competition over what's the worst sin or what's the best sin you could commit. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. We have to think in terms of grace that we're human beings. We all fail. We all have something, demons in our past, etc. You have to flush out the garbage in the stream of consciousness. And the only way to do it is post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. Every believer in Christ needs it. Now, I'm speaking specifically of alcoholics here. It just so happens it brings in the glutton as well in this passage. And both occur because of garbage in the stream of consciousness. And you can flush it out by consistency in learning the Word of God and utilizing the problem-solving devices. And you know these sins are obvious. It's obvious if you're a drunkard all the time. It's obvious if you're a glutton, it's going to show. And so you go through life with a very visible problem while others go through life with a very invisible problem and they'll never address it. So it's not a time for you to feel sorry for yourself or say, I'm a loser, I'll never make it. You're wrong! As I told you the other day, the bird with a broken wing can fly ever higher. That's what grace says. Legalism says you'll never fly again, you piece of you-know-what. Legalism is vicious. 
It's part of the old sin nature itself. It's just the other side of degeneracy called moral degeneracy. And you can be as moral as you want to be and still be a degenerate. Actually, the worst form of a degenerate is a moral degenerate. You don't give breathing room to anyone. You are what Jesus Christ describes in Matthew as a person who lays on heavy burdens on someone and when they can't bear it, you laugh at them. But you can't even bear it yourself. And it goes along the same lines of when our Lord said, pick the or remove the log from your own eye before you try to pick the speck of dust from your brother's eye. Now, whether it's a speck of dust or a log, it's not your job to remove. What removes it? Bible doctrine, and it has to be an individual decision. And in this church age, we have the privacy of the priesthood functioning to the greatest extent ever. And you have the ability the choice. You make your own choices. And you have the ability to choose, I will take in the word of God. I will rebound and keep moving. And people might think you're crazy because they'll say, well, this person acts this way one day and then this way another day. Read Romans for me. Let me, let me tell you what Paul said. He said, I did this one day, I do this the next day, I don't know what I do, why I do it. And Paul is jabbering around like a crazy person. Why? It is kind of crazy. But you have to flush out the garbage and that's what Paul was wrestling with. He had an old sin nature, strictly tied to legalism and Judaism. And he would struggle with it. And he flushed it out bit by bit, but then it would creep back up, and he would flush it out, and you'd never totally get rid of it. The Apostle Paul was on the precipice of moving straight to Pleroma to Theo, and then he took a vow. The worst thing he could have ever done. He went straight back to his area of weakness, moral degeneracy, and he was going to prove something by taking a vow. He got involved in emotional revolt of the soul and other things, and this was the Apostle Paul and he failed miserably. But guess what? He rebounded, he got back up, and he kept moving. That's what we do. That's what we need to do. And we don't need to wallow in it. Now, one thing that if you go to AA, fine. If that keeps you from drinking, wonderful. Go. Keep going. I encourage you if it keeps you from drinking. But one thing about it is after a while, you'll come to realize these people wallow in themselves all the time. Talk about their issues, their problems, their childhood, what happened, etc. Just a complete wallow in self. Well, that never solves anything. Now, you might be motivated from that, and if you are, fine. But I'm going to tell you the Word of God is the answer. And you say, but I'm still, I'm still messing up. Of course, you have an old sin nature. Now, that's not an excuse, but it's going to happen. It's your area of weakness. That's where you're most prone to fail. And so we see from this uh, the horrible things that come out of it. Son sleeping with father. Now daughters sleeping with father. Now in Proverbs, do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. Describing two totally different things, but it's related to the same thing, garbage in the stream of consciousness. That's why every single one of us, we need to come to understand what it means to have post-salvation, after salvation, what do we do? After salvation, what? Well, Post-salvation, epistemological, that's the epistles, rehabilitation. You need rehab. Every believer needs rehab. And you are rehabbed through doctrine. Now I described to you before a physical dependency where you actually need to go to a doctor and you understand that. Go back and listen to number one and two before you jump in here with number three. Or let's look at Proverbs 23, 30. Those who linger over wine 
who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. And uh, th those are, they're trying, they're sneaking around, see, trying to hide their problem, but it's obvious anyway. And they're just sneaking around, sampling wine here, sampling wine there, and that's what they do. And that's their weakness. And then in Proverbs 23, 31, it even describes it this way. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. It's almost as if the person who is talking about this knew what it's all about. And you want to know something? He did. We'll get to that. We'll get to Solomon in the next message. Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he went all out to be happy, and he actually became an alcoholic for a time. We'll find that in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning what we've noted. And now unto him who was able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Uh, and now unto him, well, I just forgot that whole thing. Well, in Christ's name we ask it, amen.